Hi everybody, welcome to Esther's podcast. Today I'm joined um, from distant lands from Norway, Oslo. Uh, we've got uh, Louisa Tuck, who is the principal cello of the Oslo Philharmonic Orchestra. Hi Louisa, morning. Good morning from very, very snowy, cold Oslo. Uh, it is. really is pretty cold today, so. Mind you, you're no stranger to cold, cold weather, as slightly milder, but still quite chilly. Before that, you were principal cello at the Royal Northern Symphonia in Newcastle, and I visited you there several times. Quite chilly there too. In a different way, slightly more wet, a bit more wild. It's just calm and cold here, so. <laughs> like it, like it. So we'll talk about your time in Oslo shortly, but first of all, I'd like to rewind the clock and go back to your very first cello teacher, who is, perhaps you could tell us. Um, my, my first cello teacher was um, a marvelous woman called Judith Bird, and she still is alive. Um, and I don't think she's teaching anymore, but we still do have some contact. Um, she was a, a kind of a bit of a force of nature for cello teaching and string teaching in Hertfordshire um, and literally set me up for having such a great um, early career, actually, because she worked for Esther and she was the um, secretary and I, I had so much experience of concerts and going to concerts and playing concerts through her which I think is um looking back on it so really vital part of our, our career to get going with performing because that's what we do um but she um introduced me to so many important people and I remember there were these amazing um annual concerts at the South Bank and Esther kind of took over um the Persarum and Queen Elizabeth Hall um, having lots of different stands of like music um, teaching and music teachers and shops and all sorts of interesting things. I'd come back with a kazoo, for example. Why not? Who doesn't need uh, one of those? Uh, always useful. Um, <laughs> but they were they had this um, annual concert that started at like nine thirty in the morning, and all of the all of the members of the String Teachers Association would line up all their students. So you would, I mean, there were loads of us playing. And all sorts, um, all sorts of people um, who are now colleagues and friends were also playing. So that's kind of nice to look back on. Um, but I did it every year. My dad has got the videos. Um, but it was it was great. And I remember that so clearly. And she was such a such a big, big, I don't know, kind of person mentor in my life. And even though I, I, I stopped studying with her when I was about nine. I still went and had chamber music teaching and always ran information by her and all the big decisions she, she was part of. Um, and actually only three years ago, she decided to give me all of her music, like a lifetime's worth of teaching material. Wow. Um, cello music, complete Haydn Mozart quartets. I mean, we're talking like brilliant Henle editions. And it came to about, I think it was about 780 kilos worth of music and a quarter size cello was shipped to Norway and arrived outside my house in this massive lorry. Um, and then, so that took up the basement for a while and I've sorted it all out now. And the really great thing about it is that now my students are using her music that I learned from. So I just, all this kind of, uh, Sheila Nelson has got a new lease of life in Norway. There and you go. Something quite sweet about it, actually. So, um, that, does that, and do the parts have your old markings in them? I mean, I used to put a date when I learned a piece. It would be, you know, nineteen seventy nine, or <laughs> with a big tick saying completed, or a little um, star in the corner. Yeah, or that was a particularly good third finger. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I've got all of those kind of Tetra Tunes books and all the fun stuff, and I don't actually have any students who are beginner beginners but um I've given a lot of that um like boxes of music like that to the the music school here and um cello ensemble music and you name it that they are just loving it and it's so nice that things that I learned from are going to a new generation of of cellists so yeah. um it's quite special it's quite special I like it so then when you were a mere nine years old, how, how old were you when you started? Um, I was seven. I got a cello for my seventh birthday. Right. And then when what you were nine. Brilliant present. <laughs> <laughs> when you were nine, you then moved to? 
Um, when I was nine, I did my audition for Purcell School and Menuhin School. And um, I ended up going to Purcell School and had eight and a half fantastic years there. Um, it's, it's a strange environment, a music school, as I think we can all, we all have had our own experiences of it. Um, but again, meeting such a wide variety of interesting people and you make friends who, you, even if they're not playing anymore or doing anything in music, they, they are still part of your life. Um, and of course, there are the, the, the big hotshots as well. Um, who go through the who go through the system but it's 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 an environment and a lifestyle and you don't realize how lucky you are i think but maybe, um, that's, the, but maybe that's the beauty of it there for me when i went to music school it, it felt so normal and wonderful mm -hmm. with a life previously not having felt normal and wonderful it was a yeah really great thing to be just surrounded but everybody loves this everybody loves music i thought it i thought it was a really great thing i, I completely agree and i i think that actually the, there was one particular teacher at, at Purcell who had a big impact on me which was the the um the head of music David Vinden and he had this ear this ear training theory um and it all came through the Kodai method and I I, I don't think I'd done anything like that kind of training your ear to benefit your playing and you don't you don't think about it when you you know uh, like stomp on up to a oral lesson at 10 to 9 every day you don't think about it but it has had such a huge impact on my my life as a musician and without that training every day for four years at the beginning of starting at Purcell uh, it's it's transformed the way I think about intervals and intonation and tuning scales um, scale methods. I mean, it, it's incredible. Can you, can you describe to us how it's <clears throat> different from just general oral training? Um, I think that the main benefit of it is that I don't have perfect pitch. Um, I have relative pitch. And if you play a note on a cello, I can tell you which one it is. But I think that's because of the, the resonance and the, um, the way that the, the note feels. Um, but it's what what he really, really zoned in on for me, especially, was that um, an interval has a reference point. So, you, so you have intonation between an interval rather than things being set. Do, do, do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. not like a piano, um, but you you obviously have to train your ear in in relative in relative ways. But um, I think it really made me aware of key systems and being able to identify keys without even thinking about it or being able to go between one key to another. I talk about this. I mean, it's I, my dad is learning the piano at the moment um, at the right age of 69 and he's doing rather well, actually, but he often he asks me questions and I refer back to the stuff I learned when I was 10, 11. Um, because there's no better way of talking about it. Um, and it's, it's brilliant. It's great. Um, but I, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a basis, it's a foundation. And I think that's what we, we what's what I rely on most of all. And um, I think especially coming to a, a, a different country, I, I look at the training that the students have here, especially I have one younger student he's 17 and um and his training is very different to ours and i mean we grow up in a culture of sight reading and orchestra and chamber music and it's it's not like that here yes what they do sorry so i was just gonna say what is it like um well they don't do sight reading it's a it's an unknown concept they don't know what to do and i i i i can't understand it because you're given time here. This is the weird thing. And it's an amazing thing about Norway that you just have a bit more time to think about what you're doing. Um, and for that reason, the artistic um, end result is incredibly gratifying. And I, you, I get a lot out of it. Um, but th there's not this emphasis on do it, come on, let's go. Um, 
but because of that, I panic because I'm worried I'm going to lose my ability to sight read. Um, but we don't even think about it in the UK, sight reading. Yeah. I, I, but because well, of... As, as professionals, we don't think about it, of course. But um, I think you know, I remember as a child constantly feeling like I was running up a down escalator, just mm -hmm. trying to sort of keep keep up with being able to keep up with everybody else but mm -hmm. I have to say it was one of the greatest joys of my professional life was being able to sight read and the mm -hmm. excitement I mean you know maybe the composer didn't intend their music to be performed like that but um I remember Prokofiev 7 with mm -hmm. um Gergiev at the LSO and for various reasons we'd had no rehearsal and uh oh my goodness it, I, it was utterly terrifying but also the most massive adrenaline rush maybe that shouldn't be what music is yeah, um, I think maybe a Prokofiev is a running theme with British orchestras. Um, it was my first ever concert with the Philharmonia and I got the phone call at about 4.30. And I'd done only rehearsal of um, the first half of the concert, not Prokofiev five in the second half. And I remember just sitting there thinking, I don't know what's about to happen. But I had no preconception about it at all, except for the difficult bit, like the last half page, of I think it's either the second or third movement that the LSO had set for the string scheme. So we got to that bit and I was like, do this bit. come on, let's do this. <laughs> but that's only half a page. Yes, and then you get to the, set, the next page which you haven't learned and then no. it's total you mean, you mean life continues? No, but I, 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 do, um, I do sit down when I'm, when I'm um, practicing and, I, and I've got all this music. I mean, it's amazing that the room is still standing and we've got so much music upstairs now. But um, and I just whip something out the out out of the wall and open it and let's go. Yeah. It's just it's really fun. I mean, and it's good to it's good to find new pieces. You can't just rely on the stuff you know. And you never know, I've, I've found so many brilliant gems of repertoire from that, and I just give it to my students, and they love it because they're not having to play something that everyone else has played when they were 15 and then they're doing it when they're 18 or whatever. So um, it's not being judged at a level. Yeah. So at least not in my, bit, not in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so after the Purcell School, was it a foregone conclusion that you would go to music college? Was there no other workplace you were gonna go? Um, for me, it wasn't really an option. Um, I'm not really good at anything else. <laughs> You are no. awfully good at the cello though, it's okay. Yeah, so, so thank goodness that was okay. Um, I think that it's, um, it's quite hard once you've gone into that groove of music school to, to, to be able to say, I'm going to do something else. And there are some brilliant, brilliant people who go through music school who don't go to music college. Um, perhaps they go and read molecular science or, or something like that. Um, and I'm thrilled for them, but I was not that person. Um, I did enjoy academic subjects and I, I love so many things now that I didn't when I was 16, 17. But it was kind of like the rite of passage. And my teacher was um, already teaching at the academy. So I was, I was maybe that I had just had that in my head as the thing I really wanted to do um and I didn't and I didn't really think about it it wasn't it wasn't a big deal auditioning for college I hadn't really thought about what happens if I don't get in that wasn't, wasn't and who, what, who was your teacher at that point when I was in sixth form at Purcell I was with Robert Max who is a colleague of yours at Junior Academy actually yeah. um fantastic cellist um brilliant teacher and I think he really set me up um in many many ways technically musically and um opened my eyes as a as a person as well actually um and he had gone to the academy as well and you know so it was you, you really want to do you you want to do something for yourself but you want to make your teacher proud as well um but it wasn't to carry on studying with him actually because I really had had my heart set on studying with Paul Watkins since I was 12 or 13 or something going to see the BBC Symphony Orchestra um, and he was sitting there looking very studious and then you meet him <laughs> he's a bit different <laughs> um, 
but he had been such a big inspiration and I really, I, I really wanted to do that. But uh, Robert had really pushed that I did auditions in other, other schools as well. So, and I'm going up to Manchester and I'm also going to the Guildhall and, but you know, I, sometimes you just know where you want to go and study. Yeah. And that's, and that's okay, I think. Um, and was it happy times at the academy for you? Um, I enjoyed a lot of things. I think that the hard thing, and I think you can ask probably nine out of 10 people who come from music college that, that the first couple of years are pretty stationary because you feel like you've learned, you, you, you've learned it all before um, in terms of the academic music line of that. Um, but the bonus of it, and I think, again, you can talk to a lot of people from music, um, from music schools who are boarding, is that you've done everything, like all the stupid stuff that everyone does as an 18 year old, you'd done it all before, or you'd seen it happen at an earlier age and thought, might not go down that route. <laughs> and I think that there are, there are so many people who unfortunately um, have, have have been put into that box of this is what you should do but they're not doing it for themselves and and they they don't end up doing so well perhaps um but also it's fine to go to music college and then say actually this isn't for me there are some really fine musicians who have said after a couple of years actually this isn't the thing i'm i'm wanting to do um yeah. and where, where were you in the pecking order in the academy were you at the top of your your year <clears throat> or did you struggle at the bottom or where were you? Um, I, the thing, the, the difficult thing I think was that I was not always the best at, at Purcell. There were um, some phenomenal cellists older than me. Um, and in my year group, there were, there were especially two very, very, very fine cellists in my class at school. Um, and then one of them ended up going to the academy um, but there were, I think there must have been seven of us in my year at the academy. Um, so we all turn up there. Um, and I was, I was kind of probably plopped in at about number two or three, maybe. That's quite a good place to be though, isn't it? Still inspired, but, but not feeling like you're at the bottom yeah. of the pile and struggling. You can kind of see it though, when you rock on up for the string orchestra rehearsal on the first day, who's the principal? <laughs> And it wasn't me. <laughs> I was very happy to page turn on that particular um, jaunt. But no, I, I mean, what was I about put in? I, no, I was certainly not the, the high, high, most highly qualified cellist there at all. Um, but um, I still, I'd still got a brilliant teacher and I was doing what I wanted to do. Um, and I knew what I wanted to do. And I'd, I, I couldn't, I was so happy. I was just so happy to be there. Um, and I was learning with the teacher I'd always dreamed of learning with and got so much out of that. Um, but I, I don't know, with, the, with the, the quality of cello playing was so high at the academy. Um, and I remember looking at people who were in the, in the more senior orchestras or the, what was it? The academy soloists and stuff with Cleo Gould. Um, and now those people are like, really good <laughs> <laughs> you <are> too, Louisa. <laughs> yeah, they, they, no but they're, they're like they're, they're really um that they were on a really high level now then and they are now and yeah. that they've it wasn't just because someone thought they were good at the academy they've they've gone on to prove themselves um so that's really it's nice to it's really nice to see um but then uh, i i was in i was lucky enough to get into those ensembles as well later on and gained so much information and found brilliant colleagues and friends who are still playing with and um and it's 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 great <laughs> it's really nice was was orchestra always the number one interest for you um honestly no i hadn't really thought about it so you were, you've ended up with quite a big orchestral, a very big orchestral career. You know, you were yeah. principal at Royal North Symphonia in Newcastle. You, mm -hmm. um, you, uh, you, John Wilson Orchestra, Oslo Phil, um, you know, and, and a big player on the London session scene as well when we persuaded you to come back. Um, so how come, what, what, what was your 
what would you have ideally wanted to focus on if it hadn't been orchestra? I, I didn't do National Youth Orchestra. I did Pro Corder. Um, okay. And I hadn't really thought, I don't think you really think about paying bills and having a life um, and making a career choice when you're 18, or at least I hadn't. Um, it just happened that I was studying with the principal cello of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And, and that's how that kind of route happened. And then I found out that I was actually quite all right at doing auditions and I wasn't really scared of playing hide and D. Um, yeah. And I hadn't got a big preconception or hang up about it, but I didn't really think about it. But then I was so lucky to take this, um, um, the Alice Owen Philharmonia side by side string experience scheme audition early. I did it a bit earlier than everyone else. And because of that, I got to be used as an extra player a lot with the Phil. So that was really good, what for me, for my experience. And, um, and then it just kind of all glided into that direction. But I hadn't actively thought about it. Yeah. So, um, but then, then you, you realise that it is, you, you do actually have to earn money to live, especially in London. <laughs> Um, well, you, you, then took, you then took the decision to take um, the job with the fantastic Royal North Symphonia in, in Scotland. Uh, Scotland, Newcastle. Newcastle. Really <laughs> Gate, in Scotland. Gatehead. Um, Gatehead. Same, same train line. Um, yeah. In Gateshead, of course, in, in the Sage. Oh, one of my favourite concert halls of, of all yeah. time. Um, how did it feel moving out of London, apart from richer? <laughs> um, yeah, um, it, it was a, a big decision to leave London, actually. And it, it was... Um, Symphonia wasn't my first audition. I'd taken an audition two days before it for Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra because I had just actually at least done an audition, a proper one, before I'd um, done, done the one at Symphonia. Um, but I think I was quite lucky because I think there's, this, uh, there's a different trial pro process over here to, in, in the UK that you can be on trial for years in the UK. And there are some people who have done auditions and they still haven't had a phone call after two years because the orchestra is working their way through yeah. the list of people. Um, but the, the decision to, to move up to, to Northern Symphonia was in some ways incredibly easy because it, I love chamber orchestra and I, I felt that I didn't have to change anything about my playing um, to fit in there other than it just had to be a bit bigger and I had to um, be in charge of a group. Being a principal is certainly a different role from sitting at the back of the Philharmonia having a brilliant time. So, um, but it is, isn't it? I mean, politically, that you know, a principal job isn't just about having to, you know, be able to pull those solos out the bag and and sort out the bowings. It, it's how did you find? I mean, the, the wonderful Bradley Kresic was uh, oh. le leading at the time. That must have been just great working with him. I think I can. I think, you know, you, you win a job when you're 25, 24, 23, however old people are when they win jobs and you, and you get a salary <laughs> and, that, and you get this thing called a pension and you're like, I'm 23, uh, come on. Um, but then, I mean, you turn up for work every day and Bradley's there and it's such, and Kyra Humphreys as well had a huge impact on me um, and Thomas Edmire was the music director and you, it's, it was the most incredible musical experience and, and education and to be able to learn, you sit there and I mean even though you're not studying anymore you kind of are, you, you have to learn, you can't just walk into a job and say oh, I've made it, I'm done. Um, but Brad was amazing and you know when we play the big symphony orchestra repertoire extending to five cellos from four um, for, for a Brahms one and then you get to the end of that second movement and Brad pulls out that solo it's just you think I'm playing on one of the best concert halls in the world I've got Thomas Edmire we're playing live on the radio um, and Bradley's playing like that there's I, I don't need to do anything else this is perfect but no, I get up at four in the morning to bomb it down to London to do a session the next day. Do you know what I mean? That that was the realism, and that was the hard thing. And so, why? Because you didn't you didn't want to let go of your work in London, or because it was just great fun and amazing money, so you're going to do it anyway. Um, I think 
I never really thought I was leaving London. I think I had my job in Symphonia. I had my job in Gateshead. And then I had my, my life and my career in London still. And trying to fit that jigsaw puzzle, that patchwork together was pretty difficult. Um, but there's an element of kind of prestige that comes with winning a principal job, what, no matter which orchestra it's in, um, to be able to be asked to do things because you are a young principal or a principal anyway, it doesn't matter your age. But it must have been absolutely exhausting. Did you ever come close to burning out? Um, yeah, twice. Really, really, very much so. Um, I remember um, I was due to do, I'd got three concertos back to back, um, two at Symphonia, two different ones. So one at the Sage and then one as a external concert and then one in London. And I thought, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> and it was just being able to maintain the level. And then I, I think I just, I, I probably just got it bit poorly afterwards and had to be in bed for a week and is it worth it no I don't think so because it, it's you you push yourself you push yourself because you're asked to do things and you don't want to say no and that's the hard thing I and I can I can only imagine how hard that is for freelancers in London because yeah. if you say no you probably you risk the you run the gauntlet of not being asked again yeah. So, um, and I was lucky that I had the, the, the salary of the job to fall back on at Symphonia. If I said no, it didn't really matter. But it was that I was worried about losing out on other stuff. Yeah. So I'd get up at four in the morning and be on the five o'clock train to arrive in London at 10 to eight to make sure I was at Angel just yeah. after nine for a 10 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. Fun. But you did also pick up some rather wonderful other work up in Newcastle Way, didn't you, with the fantastic Catherine Tickell. Right. Yeah, oh, wow. What, she's a, an amazing woman. Um, uh, she, I, I first kind of came across her because she had curated a prom um, and she was using Northern Symphonia because she's from Northumberland. Um, she's from South Shields, um, lives in Northumberland, and she was curating the first folk prom. And we did this whole collaboration of her and her band. Um, and then Symphonia were interjecting with some Percy Granger and um, fun stuff that she had put together. Um, and after that, she kind of approached me and asked me if I wanted to play in her new band. And I thought, how hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> you, just make, you just make it up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But it's not like that at all. Um, folk music is uh, that's an education. It's like when you when you listen to really uh, jazz, for example. I have absolutely no idea what's going on, but I know I like it. But that I know there's no way I could have a go. Yeah. Uh, no, it, I I'm very happy to be a listener, and I think with folk music because of the aspect of it being played. Um, mainly by string players you think how hard can it be nope <laughs> I remember turning up to this first rehearsal and, and and Catherine was like oh yeah we're just gonna play some tunes let's see what we can put together and I was like are you joking you're having a laugh you haven't got any music for me no 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 yeah and yet you were there so you had to so what did you do just sort of smile um, and look confident or did you oh that had gone <laughs> <laughs> that was out the door um I think I'd I, I think I realized quite quickly that I was going to have to do an element of improvisation which is fine um that's fine but then you have to stick to it and then you have to go, think about the the bar structure and the tonality of it and modulations and then picking up um picking up I don't know all sorts of small intricate detail of folk music is 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 an art it's 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 like thinking about the difference between french vibrato or shifting and um something maybe more germanic and uh, it's it is so it's so intricate and detailed and now i was like yeah i'll just put a little twiddle on that note and she's looking at me like don't even think about it <laughs> that, 
Did you ever come close to walking out and saying, I'm not the person for this? Um, I think the brilliant thing about Catherine is that she is a people person. She's really good with people. And she had put, she was pushing the boat out herself by putting a group together with two classical mm -hmm. musicians. So the harpist Ruth Wall um, and myself, Amy Thatcher, who's a brilliant accordionist and Catherine. So she was doing, going down a slightly more classical route herself. So she was slightly out of her comfort zone putting, we were doing tunes based on Purcell, um, some Percy Granger, there was um, uh, all sorts of different things in there, but not just tunes for fun. But we put it all, to, we, we, we kind of um, put together things ourselves and I'd written a little, I, I would, uh, she, we would come together and have like a workshop session, go away. I would write things down, notate it, take a picture on my phone, send it to Catherine and say, what do you think? And she'd say, no, no, and change it all. Um, but she was so good at, at, at being supportive about it. But when it comes to it, the bottom line is, she's incredibly famous. We were doing gigs in, in, in the Berlin Philharmonic um, and in Luxembourg and uh, big stages in Denmark and France and, and doing massive concerts in the UK. And it's fun and making CDs and you have to put together a two hour concert. And that's a lot of tunes. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens if someone's sick? Suddenly it's like, okay, Louisa, have you got 15 minutes worth of solo cello repertoire to go now? Can you do it? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Suddenly those three concertos come in handy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it's brilliant. And it's, it's, um, it's music that I, I have within me. And I love it. And um, it's, Catherine is a dear friend and I love her music. It's different to what I do, but she wrote me a, um, an encore after I played uh, Don Quixote with Oslo Phil. And she had written it for string octets. So um, the front desks of the Philharmonic and me. And it was a tune that we had played as uh, ensemble with Catherine Tekel. Yeah. And then she came out here and um, I, I was, it was like, it was like everything came together. So that was nice. How lovely. Um, yep. But then eventually, of course, your time in Newcastle ended and you moved <laughs> yeah. east. Um, just doing my geography there in my head. Uh, yeah. East over to the Oslo Phil. What was the audition and trial process like for that? Um, it's a scary world outside the UK. I'll be completely honest, it's a different ball game um, because it's unknown and you can, or certainly in my case, you can, you kind of know which jobs are coming up in the UK and you're like, oh, uh, maybe that would be, maybe that's an, a good move or that's interesting or I quite like the idea of having a go at doing that. Um, but I hadn't really considered leaving the UK. Um, I thought I'd gone far enough with two hours, 50 minutes on the East Coast mainline, north. <laughs> um, but then I, you know, a, a, a big orchestra, and I mean, the Oslo Philharmonic is, a, is, a, is an A-class orchestra. They are, they're seriously famous <laughs> um, internationally and a massive pedigree of fantastic music directors and and it's it's so that you get the phone call I missed the phone call I just have to say that um and, and I and how often do you miss a phone call and you actually google the number and not very often <laughs> but I did and then I saw it was Oslo Phil and I think at that point I think I called you and said what should I do about this <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but it was, um, it, was, it was just an invitation to come and work because I didn't know anything about them. I didn't, I'd never been to Norway before. I don't think I'd, oh no, I, I knew um, John Oscar from Liverpool, principal cello, my desk partner in John Wilson Orchestra. Didn't actually know he was Norwegian. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I don't think I, I knew anything about Scandinavia at all. 
but I got the invitation and got lined up about four four weeks worth of work at that, that point it was just one week and then they said would you come back and I said I need to I, I need to know what it's like here I, you, you fly in fly out for four days it doesn't give you a idea of what it's like at all yeah um but it was I mean this did, you is know, did you know you were being headhunted for the job at this point or was this purely no. guesting because somebody was not there no when I when I got there I realized that the job was open um, but I hadn't really thought about it. And then it was, um, it's that really funny thing that and you can see it on the other side now. Um, and I'm sure you've been in that situation. When you want to make sure that you, you get the person you want, you offer them the nicest work. Oh yes. <laughs> um, so there I rocked up for my first week with Yuka Pekka Saraste, for example. And, and it was really juicy program. Um, Brahms, Brahms first piano concerto and a trike symphony and you know it was like here you go come to Norway come to Norway and the group was the cello group were just so friendly I mean they are friendly anyway but um everyone they pulled all the stops out <laughs> and it was so it was wonderful um it rained all week um and you know nearly bankrupt myself by going to the pub so yeah. it was brilliant um but then I went back and I said can I if if you if you want me to come back I have to see what it's like here because I I need to know in a long for a longer time period um but it was just guesting and they'd advertised the job and they'd had the auditions and hadn't found anybody um so it was kind of a like finding it was doing the trial pro process before doing the audition yeah. and then they asked me after the last after my last week would I be interested in doing an audition and and everyone loves doing an audition yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no problem um and so I said I would be I'd be honored to do it to do it it's really nice to be asked to do it um but it was a bit different and um principal auditions in Scandinavia I don't know whether they do it on the continent as well but um so you obviously have to play your concertos and you play your extracts and some chamber music but then you have to play an what's called an orchestral round um and um <laughs> and it's uh quite um uh, uh, eye-opening experience and I'm glad I didn't know anything about it before I did it what repertoire um, are you playing in the orchestral round so you have to um play all the big cello solos with the principal conductor just the solo um to an empty hall which has got the jury sitting in it um and I was used to like a jury of five people at Northern uh, so, so were you sitting in the orchestra to do this with the orchestra accompanying those solos or just yeah you? yeah so you walk out you go you the orchestral manager came and got me from my room and the whole orchestra is sitting on the on the podium on the stage and Vasily Petrenko, who was the principal conductor at that point, is there. Um, had a great relationship with him, very, very kind man to me. Um, so I didn't feel like I was going to throw up at that point. Um, but it was basically, so um, I think I had six of the big solos. And it was like, sit down, play them. So, so maybe three minutes of William Tell, off we go. And you didn't know what these would be in advance? No, no, I was sent the music, maybe they told me three weeks beforehand. Okay. Um, and then, but it's like you play the famous bit, or the cello solo, that's the famous bit. The famous bit to you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, then you, and then you stop, and then you go into Schoss 15, and then you stop, and then you go into Brahms Second Piano Concerto, and then you go into a Haydn Symphony, and then you do, it, it's, um, these, these big solos come up once a season mm. and we managed to nail it in 15 minutes yeah. so. but it was, it's um it's you dig deep and now I sit on the jury for people doing this doing the solo round audition and I am on their side more than they will ever know yeah I just I, don't I find, think that I find sitting on juries more stressful than doing the audition myself I 
I feel for the people too much <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> you, know, it, you know, knowing what they've been through, how, how it feels yeah. to, to sit and, you know, be- That whole process. Um, and also, I mean, we, I mean, I can totally say it. I mean, I suffer from being nervous and um, I, I know what it's like to get that feeling of your heart rate going up through your neck into your mouth. Um, and you can't really remember anything else that's going on. I can't tell you who I was sitting next to in my orchestral round. I remember I had a bit of an issue with the height of my chair. Um, I was a bit like unhappy about that. I remember looking over and um, and Kath Bullock, our incredible principal viola, looked over at me and I was like, oh, British person. And she just smiled. And I thought, oh, thank goodness there's someone who here who I can look at in the eye and they're on my side. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, the orchestra is so generous and you, you get to the end of it and it's, you've climbed Everest and you've rolled back down the other side. And, and they applaud you and then you walk out and you catch the Ryanair flight home. <laughs> and then you got the call, you're off for the job and you took the monumental decision to move country. Um, how yeah. was it assimilating into the even chillier Norwegian climate? Um, I mean, the, the cuisine must have been... <laughs> As a vegetarian, it was tip top. Yeah, um, so how's that gone for you? <laughs> no, it was, I have to be honest though, I think I, it wasn't, it was an easy decision and it was a hard decision to to quit everything you know um and it was it was really difficult um but I'd say for my first year I was back in the UK every other week um it's so easy it was so easy was, to yes. travel home um and I could actually get from my house in Oslo to my dad's house in Hertfordshire quicker than I could from Gateshead. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, the irony. Um, yeah. yeah, so that was uh, quite fun. But I, I, it was, it was a hard decision, but it was an easy one. But they have this um, kind of tryout, it's not even tryout, it's um, like, it's a trial, <laughs> um, six months. But because I was doing so much work in London still, that um, it took a bit longer for me to pass my my tryout trial, mm. um, and it gave me even more opportunity to think: Is this the right decision? Do I want to do this? Um, Was there a moment but, where you suddenly thought, "I'm going to commit. I'm going to do it. I'm going to stay," or did it happen gradually? Um, I think so. They split your trial process into three two months. Um, so, so after you've done two months worth of work, you are assessed and the jury meets and the group meet and they talk about um, whether you are the right person for that job. So it's not a foregone conclusion that you will, yeah. that that is your job. You're protected yeah. obviously, but by Norwegian law, but um, it goes both ways. If I have a massive problem with something, I can also speak up, not that you dare to, but um, if, for example, that the, it could someone could say, um, I don't think the solo is loud enough, or she, her projection isn't great, or I find that um, she's difficult to work with, or we would like a little bit more collaboration in the group. There are lots of things that could come up, but I luckily came away completely clean after my two months. So I realised after that, I thought, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to think a little, maybe a little bit more seriously. I hadn't um, shipped over all my, all my things, for example. I'd maybe got about four suitcases worth of things, mm. um, and hadn't, and I was renting a, a beautiful apartment here. Um, but then I hadn't really thought about committing and being here enough, so. It, but of course, com committing and deciding that that's definitely you're going to definitely take it also involves starting to turn down the stuff in London, which yeah. uh, is very lucrative. All your friends are there. Um, yeah. It's a very hard, hard decision. Did it just happen sort of organically over time that um, you just turned down too much stuff and in the end didn't come back? Or was there a moment where you thought, I have to now 
psychologically decide that I'm going to say no to that stuff? Um, I think with, with all things in life that we would like to have the choice. We would like to say, I am choosing to filter now. But realistically, it doesn't really work like that. Um, I think that you, when you're on the circuit in, in the UK, for example, with sessions, you have to answer that text message quickly. Mm. You, have to, um, you have to make it work if you want to do it. Um, and there's, a, there's only so many times you can say no. Um, as soon as I moved, as soon as I got the job, I got a lot of phone calls, <laughs> um, and which was really nice in the UK. A lot of really nice ones and a lot in Scandinavia. And that was brilliant. And I thought, wow, I mean, you, I played well for 45 minutes and now people want me. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was brilliant. And you're kind of, and it, it's exciting. But then the phone calls do, do stop. But I, have got a dream job yeah and, and I that, love it and not just a dream playing job but you're also mm. now teaching yourself not mm. teaching yourself but teaching <laughs> um tell us you have uh, two rather interesting teaching jobs in Oslo. yeah um I have a small professorship job at the Norwegian Music Academy which is um fantastic it's the job I always wanted um it's to be head of the orchestral string program um and it's something i care about so much um and it's to to make sure that students get the right training to do auditions because i had that and i i really think it's important that people have that <laughs> from me um, I was so lucky to have a teacher who was in a symphony orchestra and have colleagues and friends who were willing to listen to me play and go through uh, late at night in their living room with a gin and tonic <laughs> um, before doing auditions and be brutally honest. Um, and are you introducing more sight reading into that programme then? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually, uh, I, it's brilliant actually that the, uh, the level is really high. I'm really lucky that the, the students are uh, 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 a good <laughs> that's step one um and the other cello faculty that both professors are brilliant um and neither of them are orchestral musicians so I have my bit and they do their thing um but we have it's really great and I run the or, um the orchestral academy for Oslo Philharmonic well I don't run it I'm head of it um but is, is that like a side-by-side -side scheme yeah um, so they, but actually they do uh, six projects a year, um, either three or six. So, and they, it's a two year program. Um, and I really, I really like it. And I, I like getting to know them. I feel like I've been through it and I gained so much from it and met so many amazing people. I want to help them enjoy it and give them the opportunities that I had. And so that's, that's brilliant. I really enjoy that. Um, working at the Music Academy. And then I'm um, also teaching at Baradua um, Music Institute, which is a smaller school also in Oslo. And I have uh, three bachelor students, one master's student, and um, what's called a young talent. Um, so that's the, of the age group, 12 to 18, and he's 17. Um, very funny guy. So I, I'm lucky and they are so great. Um, and they, they are really, high quality and I'm, I think it's great. I mean, who knew? I didn't know anything about Norway. I didn't know, I mean, obviously Truls Merck is the most famous cellist to come out of Norway. Um, but the, the level of, of playing here is great. And I really enjoy teaching, thankfully in English. Um, I was gonna ask actually, yes, how good is Norway or Norwegian? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, it's really interesting because when you arrive somewhere, in a foreign country, I threw myself into the, the language and have the Philharmonic put on a teacher for us. And, um, but naturally you gravitate, your friendship circle gravitates to the people who speak the same language as you. So um, my friends were Australian, English, and uh, a lot of the, the British French speaking 
people, Americans, and it's, I mean, you, you naturally start talking that language. But um, I do have a, a student now, this, this younger guy who is from Northern Norway and his English isn't quite so fluent as the slightly older ones. Um, so we do a, he speaks Norwegian and I speak a combination back. So, um, but I'm not, it's, this, it's also this thing about being, as a musician, we really, we want to be perfect. We don't want to mess up. And I don't want to say, I don't want to speak another language and make a mistake. Yes. Um, and that's, that's it really, isn't it? So I don't, I mean, I, I'll be saying, this is what you need to do, this, this, let's try and find this together. And then you make a mistake. And then it's like, well, everything I've just said is not real. <laughs> <laughs> well, Louisa, I think your playing certainly speaks for itself. Um, mm. You're a wonderful cellist and we miss you terribly over here. <sighs> um, although you do make it back occasionally. So I hope to see more of you in 2022 on a okay. social level as well as a music level. Yes. Um, and maybe we'll pop over to Norway when COVID dies down. Um, but thank you so much for joining me today. It's been just lovely. Thank you very much for having me.